So let's compare pemphigus foliaceus and pemphigus vulgaris. So histologically, they're not very difficult to tell apart. Um, you just need to remember what you're looking for. So pemphigus foliaceus is going to have a separation of the stratum corneum and the granular layer here. It's gonna be splitting right at that point. So the rest of the epidermis is pretty intact. So it's really just a superficial vesicle or bulla uh, forming. And that's why typically you don't even see intact vesicles clinically in pemphigus foliaceus. And you need to remember the autoantibodies that are targeting what antigens. So pemphigus foliaceus is typically associated with anti-desmoglein 1. And on direct immunofluorescence, you'll see the fluorescence in between the keratinocytes. And it's most of the signal is going to be up where desmoglein 1 is strongly expressed, which is the superficial epidermis. And again, you want to go perilesional when you're doing the direct immunofluorescence. Um, you don't want to be looking for that pattern in a lesional skin because it's going to be detached there. So go perilesional to um, the actual lesion in pemphigus foliaceus for your DIF to look for that uh, IgD deposition in the superficial intraepidermal region. But on H&E, um, when you see this pattern of a split at the granular layer, you need to be thinking pemphigus foliaceus, Bullis and Petigo and Staph scalded skin syndrome can give the same type of split. Um, so that's where your direct immunofluorescence as well as your clinical is going to help you separate those entities. Um, so obviously, um, Bullis and Petigo and Staph scalded skin will be negative on DIF. Plus, the clinical scenarios are quite different as well. So pemphigus foliaceous, you're going to see more of a, a ruptured lesions uh, on the back and, and abdomen and extremities uh, of patients. And with staph scalded skin, many times it's going to be uh, younger patients that have an area of staph and it's exotoxin driven. Um, and so the exotoxins will cleave desmoglein 1. Same with bullus and petigo, except with bullus and petigo, you're going to find more of the um, gram positive cocci up here. So if it's pretty clean like this, um, you should definitely think about pemphigus foliaceus first. You don't see a lot of bacteria. Again, staph scalded skin syndrome is going to be indistinguishable from this picture because you're not going to have a lot of bacteria in staph scalded skin either. So that's pemphigus foliaceus. Pemphigus vulgaris looks very different. So you have, it's not technically a subepidermal, it's, it's still an intraepidermal uh, bulla forming here because you have a layer of keratinocytes that are still attached to the basement membrane and they stick out like little tombstones and that's where you get that that buzzword tombstoning um, but you'll see a intraepidermal um, acantholytic change essentially uh, the cells are breaking apart because of the anti-desmoglein 3 that's typically targeted. You can have anti-desmoglein 1 and 3, but usually it's uh, the anti-desmoglein 3 process that's causing this detachment here and this clefting at the, the bottom part of the epidermis near the basal layer. Um, so that's your classic pemphigus vulgaris. And I typically think of pemphigus vulgaris as being more likely to involve adnexal structures um, compared to another entity called Haley Haley, where you might get very similar histologic pictures of acantholysis without much dyskeratosis. And that's what we're seeing here. So um, clinically, Haley Haley is going to be uh, appearing most likely to be even more flaccid vesicles um, forming these kind of wet plaques many times in the intertriginous areas. So clinically it presents differently than pemphigus vulgaris and it is not an autoantibody mediated process. It's a defect in ATP 2C1, which is a calcium pump and that leads to the defect in the acantholysis. So um, very different pathophysiologies, but very similar uh, histopathologic appearances. But I find that pemphigus vulgaris uh, extends down adnexal structures much more commonly than Haley Haley. So that can be one helpful clue. Not to say that in Haley Haley that's impossible, but um, 
that's just something that it, that uh, it can be a helpful hint. If you find odd nexal extension in, in your acantholysis, then think about pemphigus vulgaris. All right, so um, we, we discussed the autoantibody. And again, if you did the direct immunofluorescence, you would find mostly intraepidermal signal, but it would be down near the bottom uh, compared to pemphigus foliaceus.